Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Nicole Lamberson, and I was trained as a physician assistant, and I volunteer doing outreach for the film Medicating Normal, and I host conversations like the one we're going to have today. Our guest today, some of you will recognize, she is my colleague over at Benzodiazepine Information Coalition. It's Dr. Christy Huff. She's a cardiologist and medical director of Benzo Info Coalition, or BIC, as some people call it, which is a nonprofit that educates about the adverse effects of prescribed benzodiazepines. And in addition to her work at BIC, Dr. Huff is a member of the Colorado Consortium for the Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention's Benzodiazepine Action Work Group. She writes frequently about her lived experience with benzodiazepines. Her personal experience with protracted benzodiazepine withdrawal led her to realize the serious risks of these medications and the knowledge gaps in the medical community surrounding benzodiazepines. And she specifically advocates for better, better education of physicians regarding the adverse effects of benzodiazepines and how to safely taper patients off of these medications. Her research interests include patient-centered benzodiazepine deprescribing and something called benzodiazepine-induced neurological dysfunction. The short term for that is BIND. And there's a new paper out, which she is a co-author of, called Long-Term Consequences of Benzodiazepine-Induced Neurological Dysfunction, a Survey. So today, Christy's here with us, and she's going to tell us all about this new paper and uh, what it means and... Uh, all of that. So welcome, Christy. Thank you so much for joining today. Thanks, Nicole, for the lovely introduction, and thanks for having me here today. Sure. All right. So the first question, I guess, a lot of us know you, but there's people in the audience who don't. So uh, like I said in your intro, you're medical director of Benzo Info Coalition, and that's a nonprofit that's educating about benzodiazepines and their risks and harms specifically when taken as prescribed. And there's this new paper out called Long-Term Consequences of Benzodiazepine-Induced Neurological Dysfunction, which we're going to discuss here for most of the interview. But I think to start, for those who don't know you, maybe you could just give us a brief introduction of yourself and why you became interested in spotlighting you know, benzodiazepine concerns in the first place. Sure. So um, my background is in cardiology, um, but I became involved with benzodiazepines because I have um, lived experience um, with what we're now calling BIND. Back in 2015, I was prescribed um, Xanax, what's considered to be a low dose. And within a few weeks, I developed um, physical dependence and uh, tolerance and interdose withdrawal. And it was really difficult because I was getting really sick and none of my doctors knew what was um going on and I had to go online um, to figure out what was happening with me. And, um, and actually I learned how to taper off the medication um, online. I learned about the Ashton manual and switched over to Valium. And it took me over three years to taper off using Valium. And it was a really difficult process with lots of symptoms and effects in my life. And, um, you know, I, I was struck by the fact that I had never really been taught about this in medical school. And um, so that's kind of how I got big involved in advocacy because I was just, you know, struck by the lack of knowledge in this area. And also the, you know, the number of patients that I met online that were also struggling in the exact same way that I was. Yeah. Most medical providers in this space, when you look around, you know, myself, you, and, and the others that we know of, the passion comes from the fact that we lived it or experienced it ourselves and, and the knowledge too. So thank you for, you know, taking your experience and turning into uh, such good work. All right. So I think we'll start with sort of the history of where, because this paper that we're going to talk about today is the third paper there's two prior, and for people who haven't read the first and the second, we can link those below if you're interested in reading those. But all of them, if I'm correct, stemmed from a benzodiazepine experience survey. So you guys gathered data from patients who have or had benzodiazepine experience, 
And then I guess you're taking the data that you got from the survey and you've turned it into three papers. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So just a little background on the survey. So back in 2018, when I was still, um, I had become involved with BIC and was the, you know, the medical directory or director. And I was, um, you know, still going through my paper, but I was approached by, um, a communication specialist named Jane McCubrey, and she had extensive experience for survey design. And she had also been um, affected by benzodiazepine, benzodiazepines as well. She'd actually been through a, a cold turkey and had, um, you know, lots of protracted symptoms after that. And she really wanted to capture um, the experiences, especially some of these severe and protracted symptoms that um, we that we go through. And so we. Um, designed the survey together. I mean, she, I think she did the bulk of it, but she got a lot of, a lot of input from me because of my advocacy experience. And, um, and we kind of used both of our lived experiences as well. And also pulled from the existing um, medical, medical literature regarding um, benzodiazepine withdrawal as well. And then we posted the survey link in um, mainly benzodiazepine withdrawal support groups, but also some um, support groups that dealt with general mental health and wellness as well, just trying to capture the experiences of um, some of these um, people. Mm -hmm. When you, when you guys were designing the survey, I guess Jane was sort of the expert then in, you know, like how to do these things so that they'll pass, you know, scientific, you know, scrutiny essentially. Yeah, exactly. So she had a a software package that was meant for designing survey surveys and she had done many surveys in the past so she that was de definitely her level of expertise but then you know where I came in was um informing the questions that we wanted to ask because there were you know very specific things that we wanted to know that had come up from what our experience um you know working with this affected community okay so I guess let's get into then what kind of questions the survey uh, asked and sought to answer? Yeah, so we asked about a lot of things. Of course, you you do have to keep, we couldn't ask about every single thing we wanted to just because you have to keep the, the survey kind of a reasonable length to complete. But even with that, we still were able to gather a lot of data. So we, we asked people what benzodiazepine that they were um, taking. We asked um, you know, we asked about other medications. We asked about why they were prescribed the benzodiazepine. We asked about 23 different um, uh, withdrawal symptoms that were pretty common in the, that we had seen in the support groups. And of course, this was not a comprehensive list because there's maybe been 80 to 100 symptoms reported, but we just tried to stick to some of the, the things that were most commonly seen. Uh, we asked about um, different life effects. Um, and then we we also asked about um, length of time that people had tapered or whether maybe they had um, stopped abruptly, things like that. Okay. Did the people answering the survey have any criteria? Like, did they have to be still on a benzo or off a benzo, or it could have been either or? Yeah, so it was basically all comers, anybody that had experience with benzodiazepine use. So you could be on your full dose of benzodiazepine where you had never started on a taper. You could have be in the process of tapering off the medication like I was um, at the time of the survey, or um, you could have been fully off benzodiazepines but had that past experience. And we did um, look at the data with those three different categories as well in, in some of our analyses. Okay. I think probably I participated in the survey. So this is exciting. Like yeah, I'm sure yeah, I'm people sure watching did. probably did too. So it's like, all right, well, let's see, you know, what you guys um, got from it. <clears throat> so um, why do you think then in your opinion, it's important to like when you were uh, designing the survey uh, why is it important to incorporate lived experience and, and not only like in this survey, but just like in scientific research in general, um, like the fact that you and I, for example, are on, you know, this committee and people might not know about it, but there's a committee that's formed, um, where the FDA has given some grant money to the American society of addiction medicine. 
and they want to come up with deprescribing guidelines for benzodiazepines that I guess the FDA is going to like put in the literature with benzos. So just in the in the grand scheme, like for informing this uh, deprescribing guidance for the FDA and for um, surveys like this in order to write papers, like why do you think it's important that we have to incorporate the patient voice into all of these things? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons. I mean, first of all, it's just, it's hard to really understand what it's like to go through an illness and about, unless you've actually lived it yourself and to be able to um, um, figure out what that patient population, um, what needs need to be met. Um, and I'll say, you know, like patients have been sounding the alarm on this benzodiazepine issue for the um, last 60 years, and we haven't been incorporating that lived experience. And so we kind of have the situation today where people are flocking to like online communities to support each other, and there's really no support and help. I mean, things are getting better now that we're, uh, we've been doing all this advocacy in the past few years, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's just so important um, that we're informing these things with our lived experience so that people can get the the care that they need. Yeah, I agree. And so far, so good. I mean, we're early on in the stages too of the, the FDA deprescribing, you know, meetings, but they've really been interested in the patient voice and what we've had to say so far. So yeah, yeah. yeah I feel like they've really been listening to us. So I'm, I'm hopeful that some of that's going to be incorporated. Of course, you never, you never know. I mean, I think this is a new process for them um, as well, but that's sort of the new model of care is this patient centered care and shared decision-making. So, I mean, we've, we've just got to be involved. That's the way it needs to be going forward. Yeah. I mean, that was one of my biggest lessons, I think, in going through this myself. Like when I look back at how I practiced as a PA before I got sick, it was all about like what I was taught and that kind of thing. But now like actually living something like this, that's so misunderstood by medicine. You start to really understand like the patients really do know their bodies super well, and they know best about the condition and they can teach you and inform you and if you're a patient and you need like a, a specialist or something, like think about how much it took for us to like really know the nitty gritty of the whole benzodiazepine stuff. Like you have to sort of live it and breathe it in order to become like a true expert, I think, in uh, a topic. And there's so much to know, you know, so yeah, I, I agree that that the patient voice is so important. And there's like a, a meme. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's something like, make no mistake, you know, the people living with the condition are the experts, the true experts. So yeah, for sure. All right. So I'm sure people are going to see the survey and say, oh, there's limitations. Like maybe you recruited people who had problems with benzodiazepines. So what, what were the other limitations or if people were to criticize the survey a little and say, well, what about this or that? What would they say? Yeah, so that's a good question. Of course, with any um, research study, there are going to be limitations. So, I mean, we've, um, ours would be that it's a self-selected population. So obviously a lot of these people that are flocking to these groups are having problems and it, so it may not be a representative population of all benzodiazepine users. Um, you know, there was no control group of, you know, of other population to compare against. Um, and these things were self-reported. So we weren't going through medical records. Literally people were just going through and answering um, survey questions. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, we didn't capture every single um, survey that, or every single symptom that people had uh, experienced. Mm -hmm. So just for my own curiosity, though, if it's a, if it's a benzodiazepine experience survey, yeah, I guess, I mean, you were specifically looking for adverse effects though, right? And harms. So how could you have included people who had a better time? Is, is yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess that we could have done some type of study looking at all benzodiazepine users across the board, whether they were having problems or not. 
Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And our, our population was more cited to the population that was going to be having problems because they were in support groups. Now, some, some of the people that answer the questionnaire were in that population that were having problems because they were just in some more like general wellness groups. But I think the majority of our population was more in that harmed group. Okay. All right. So now let's get into the meat and bones of the third paper that st- you know resulted from this survey. Again, if you haven't read the first or second, we'll link them for you in the description or the comments below. The third paper is entitled Long-Term Consequences of Benzodiazepine-Induced Neurological Dysfunction, and BIND is the term for benzodiazepine-induced neurological dysfunction. So we'll also link this third paper below for anybody who wants to take a closer look at it. Um, On to the paper then. What was the aim of this third new paper? And I guess, what were the findings that you guys uh, came up with? Yeah. So I'll just give you an an overview on the first two papers um, because I didn't do that before. Um, So the first paper Um, was basically just a general overview of our survey results. And in the next two papers, we took a deeper dive into analyzing or further analyzing the data. So in that second paper, it kind of emerged that there was symptoms that appeared to be more short-term, like um, seizures and tremors, while there were other longer-term symptoms. And we postulated that, you know, there was a difference between the security acute um, withdrawal versus um, these protracted symptoms that um, continue on um, for months or even years. And so in our third paper, we decided to um, better quantify um, these prolonged symptoms and try to correlate them um, with the life consequences that people are experiencing. And then we really wanted to give a name to this um, clinical entity that was kind of fitting. And so that's where we came up with the term um, find. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, when we looked at the the data, you know, we found some interesting things regarding symptoms. So um, symptoms were long lasting, a lot of individuals. So of all the yes answers to symptom questions, around three quarters said the duration of those symptoms was months or years. And there were um, 10 symptoms that emerged that like in over 50% of people that um, were present over a year. And these were things like low energy, anxiety, memory loss, sleep disturbance, some of the, um, you know, the common things that most of us probably experience in this. And then interestingly enough, it's, it wasn't just symptoms that people were experiencing, but they had a lot of, um, life consequences in multiple areas. So, um, we looked at a total of 16 general life consequences and people were averaging um, eight that they attributed to benzodiazepines. So, so that's kind of the, the basics. And then obviously the name um, bind, you know, came from this whole paper as well, which I think we'll talk about in a, a minute. Yeah. Okay. Just curious. What were, what were some of the life consequences that people attributed to bind. yeah so we asked about some specific things like or sorry some more general things like um marriages and relationships and how has it affected your work loss and your or your 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 work life and your ability to um you know do like fun recreation and hobbies there was all sorts of things we asked and then we asked for some for more specific events like did you lose your job did you experience um suicidal thoughts or violent thoughts, um, things like that. Okay. All right. Yeah. So on to this term, this acronym BIND, I I want you to explain for us what is BIND because I know a lot of people in the withdrawal community picked up the term and sort of ran with it and they were using it and we were waiting patiently for this paper to come out so that we could have all the details about what exactly is Find, and I myself need to know and learn more about it too. So I'd love for you to tell us about it specifically. And also just how you came up with the name bind, what the process of it was, because I know 
over the 13 years I've been in the community, there's been a lot of back and forth of like, could we call it something? Well, you know, long, long, long ago, there was even like people wanting to call it Ashton later syndrome or, you know, like there's been attempts. And so I'm just curious why bind when you guys chose that? Yeah. So, um, we'll, um, start with the working definition from our paper. So, BIND stands for benzodiazepine-induced neurological dysfunction. And again, we just call it BIND because it's kind of a catchy acronym and obviously much, much easier to say. So BIND describes a constellation of functionally limiting neurologic symptoms, both physical and psychological, that are the consequences of neuroadaptation and or neurotoxicity resulting from benzodiazepine exposure. So, you know, that's a a lot to say. but maybe we'll kind of impact some of that. So when we're talking, we're thinking it's related both to neuroadaptation and neurotoxicity. So neuroadaptation is going to, it's sort of the new terminology we're using for physical dependence. So it's the physiologic process where the, you know, you introduce a foreign substance, like a medication into the system and the body is going to um, try to interact that to maintain or try to counteract that to, uh, maintain equilibrium. So then when you go and remove the drug, then you're going to get um, withdrawal symptoms, basically. Mm-hmm. And then neurotoxicity, on the other hand, is more of a pathologic process where there's actual damage occurring in the, the nervous system. Okay. I, I know at one point there was like some talk about uh, that bind can happen when you're still on the drug. And when you're tapering from it and off of it. Can you unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah. And I I think this is something that we're still working to um, understand, but I've, you know, if the drug is giving you some level of neurotoxicity, then it's going to be happening during the exposure process. And, uh, you know, during the taper as well, until you're fully off of it. And then you know, any symptoms that you're left with after you go through that acute withdrawal process would be these, um, you know, long lasting protracted symptoms we're talking about. So I think when you're actually still on the medication, whether you're on the full dose or in the middle of the taper and you're still experiencing symptoms, it's kind of hard to know the difference between bind and withdrawal until after the fact and the drug's fully out of your system. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so maybe that could be in the future as it's looked at more like looked at as a way to determine maybe who's going to go on to get long-term, you know, symptoms, although we don't know that now, but um, I'm just thinking back to my own experience. Like I was having pretty significant problems already on, on, while I was on the medication. I know you were as well. So, and there's some people who just are fine. They're taking and they're fine. And then they start the taper and they have like typical withdrawal symptoms that sort of resolve quickly after they're done with the taper. And that's that. So right. maybe, you know, some of this bind stuff happening while you're still on the drug, we could look at and see if it was some sort of predictor of long-term, you know, symptomatology or something. Yeah. It'll be nice to find a way to, to study this and tease this all apart. Obviously we've got our work cut out for us. But yeah, definitely I was experiencing, you know, terrible interdose withdrawal symptoms. Um, and you know, I think I was pretty much damaged within a few weeks and I struggled all the way through my taper and it was just sick the entire time. So, and really things started to get a lot better for me once the drug was fully out of my system, but it was a long process to get off the, the medication. Yeah. So I like that, that, you know, it's, benzodiazepine induced, you know, that makes sense to me. And then neurological dysfunction. I mean, certainly at, you know, I'm like 11 some years now, if you include the the time period where I reinstated and tapered again. And uh, I, I definitely have neurological dysfunction that's happening because why would I still have symptoms, you know, 10 plus years on. So I like I like the term, but I'm wondering if you guys had other ones that you were sort of tossing around in the process of making the final decision. Yeah. So first of all, we, 
we did this just because there there have been so many different terms out there in the past, like protracted withdrawal and pause and benzo withdrawal syndrome and benzodiazepine injury. And you you mentioned that one, the latter something. So oh, that was like really old. Yeah. Later <laughs> Ashton syndrome. Yeah. It was but, like, I, mean, I think it just attempt, gets, I think, yeah. Confusing for everyone. And then, you know, a lot of these tr- terms that, um, that have were withdrawal in them don't really adequately, um, describe what we're going through because with withdrawal, it's implied that it's going to be over maybe in a, a few weeks and there's not going to be long lasting symptoms. So we really wanted to um, find a word that would kind of unify and then accurately describe what was going on. So um, Bernie Silverno with the Alliance got together a team of um, experts. They had both clinical, lived experience, academic experience, and some had, um, you know, both or all of the above. And we use this process called the Delphi method, which is kind of a structured communication technique to get experts to agree on something or to come to a consensus. And so we went through these multiple rounds of um, voting. We kind of came up with a list of um, things that would be um, candidates. I think benzodiazepine induced was always always there because that, that's pretty... Um, self-explanatory, but we kind of went back and forth. Um, the the word neurological, should it be like neuropsychiatric or neurocognitive, or should this be more of a psychiatric condition? And I think most of us concluded that, I mean, there's some really f- physical things going on here. It's not just a psychiatric condition. And so we, j- we just wanted to stick with the word neurological so that it didn't turn out to be something that sounds like it's all in the person's head. I mean, this is, this is a very real process that people are going through. And then there was some discussion about whether this was the last letter D should stand for disorder or for dysfunction. And I think disorder is, um, has more defined criteria than dysfunction. And so we kind of settle on that for now, just because we're still in the very beginnings of defining um, you know, what bind is, what are symptoms are associated. I mean, that's where all of our research is going to come in. Okay. Yeah. I guess just to expand a little bit more, like when we're talking about the term withdrawal and protracted withdrawal specifically, what kinds of, um, stuff have you been noticing in just in your position at BIC and checking your emails from people reaching out and interacting with people in the communities about like how the medical uh, community was receiving the message, I guess, when patients were coming in saying like, I'm in withdrawal, but it's been seven years or I'm in protracted withdrawal, but it's been nine years. Like, what, what does medicine think when they hear the term withdrawal, really? I mean, I will say when you're talking about protracted withdrawal, most doctors have never even heard of it. When you're just talking about acute withdrawal or just withdrawal in general, doctors are thinking it's some, you know, fairly self-limited process that's going to be over in weeks after, you know, fully coming off the drug. And so then when you have these patients coming in saying, I have all these symptoms and I think it's from the drug, they're like, no way, you know? So it's, it's very problematic, um, I think. And then, yeah, I mean, I don't think that I was ever taught about the concept of protracted withdrawal during my training. So it was definitely a very um, foreign concept to me. Yeah. And even when you do look into it, like for other drugs and stuff that cause it like I don't see it like much of it going on for long long like like benzos do you know it's it's pretty unbelievable to medical doctors when I show up and tell them like yeah it's this started for me in 2010 and I haven't been exposed to the drug in so 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 long you know they think it's just it has to be something else or you hear like it can't be from the drug and certainly you're not in withdrawal anymore, you know? So, um, yeah. Yeah. And I rarely talk about it with my doctors, even when I was going through the throes of my taper and things were so horrible, I just kind of, they were on a need to know basis because every time I started to talk about it, they got this kind of like, 
like I was coming from outer space. It was this yeah. <laughs> very the same, like glazed over look, like, you know, and then it's like, well, we should probably work you up for MS or, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Um, all right. So I guess let's talk about uh, if we know how many people get fined and if we know about risk factors for developing it. Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, if we look at, so the literature on this is very um, sparse because we looked at some of the literature and even quoted it in our, um, in this particular paper. Um, but Ashton estimates, if you read the Ashton manual, maybe 10 to 15% of people will experience a protracted syndrome after coming off of benzodiazepines. I mean, I may be biased because um, this is the group of people that I work with, but I, I feel like it could be even higher because it's simply under-recognized. Mm -hmm. And so we're definitely going to need to do some studies. On yeah. That. Stop right there though. Cause I think when we say the 10 to 15%, it's a little confusing for people because there's a percentage of people that get withdrawal period when they come off the drug. Right. right? So mm -hmm. what percentage is that usually? out of a hundred, the people who have trouble, essentially. I think it, I've seen anywhere from 40 to 80. I think we usually just say roughly half of people will have some amount of problems. And then the 10 to 15 is in, of the ones that have a problem. It's not out of a hundred, essentially then it's just of the people who struggle. So it's even smaller number. Yeah. I think it, I think that could be right. Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, but then I, again, I wonder about those numbers because it, they were done in such a small population as, is it underestimated because it's simply not, it's not something that's going to make it into the medical records at this point, because it, in doctors' minds, it doesn't exist. So yeah, exactly. And, you know, uh, with our work that's just started with this committee for the FDA, you know, we've done, they've done a whole literature review and sort of come back and told us that the, the, the amount of evidence out there is very small and the amount of good evidence is even smaller. So I don't know that we have much that says specifically, you know, this is the, this is the number that you can sort of pin down. I've seen the same as you just totally, you know, different ranges and even some of them aren't comparable because uh, if you look at some of the, the studies, they'll say, you know, this percentage of people will have trouble, but they've been on for six months or more. And then another study might be like people who only took it for a shorter period of time. And this percentage of people have trouble. So you even have to like make sure that you're comparing apples to apples and, and that kind of thing when you're looking at the numbers that are out yeah. there. Yeah, you're right. The literature is all over the place. And I, I sort of hate it when people ask me for <laughs> statistics about it, because it's like, I just don't really know 100% because just the way the, the literature is. And yeah, I mean, they they came, ASAM came to the same conclusion as we, we did um, with their review and that the literature is very much lacking and we need further research in this area. Yeah, exactly. So, <clears throat> all right. Um, did we, did we say the risk factors for bind? No, I didn't. I think we got stuck on Sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's totally fine. Um, so that's another thing that we're going to need to to elucidate, I will say that, I mean, if you look in the literature, they say withdrawal in general is going to be a higher risk if you're on a higher dose and, and longer term use. But I think there's probably some more factors as well. Like I've always wondered if there's genetic factors and of course that would remain to be elucidated. And then I think some of the worst cases that I've seen are the people that cold turkey or do a very rapid taper off of benzodiazepines because the their nervous system is you know not able to adapt that quickly and the, you know is you sustain damage that way so i mean we're still advocating for those um long slow tapers based on symptoms you know yeah and so maybe two other ones could be like what we discussed before people having trouble already when they're on the medication might be one that you guys discover down the line mm -hmm. and um oh the other one just slipped out of my head that's my that's my wonderful ben benzo memory if it pops back in i'll let you know but 
So I'm um, just driving somewhere yesterday and I completely forgot what I was where I was going. And I was like, yeah. from time to time. And so I still have some lingering stuff going on, you know? Yeah. Oh, I know. Kindling. If somebody's had yes. multiple attempts, maybe at coming. Yeah, that's a good one that I left out. Yeah. All right. Let's see. So the big question that everybody wants to know, am I going to recover from bind? Do people recover from bind? Because now that we have this name and it sounds so scary and oh my gosh, you have neurological dysfunction. Is it permanent or what does it mean? Yeah. So first of all, you know, we came up with this name not to, to scare people or um, say that you won't heal or anything like that. I mean, nothing, nothing has changed with our, our thinking. It's just that we wanted to come up with a term that's going to validate the patient's experience and describe what they're going through accurately and give them a tool basically to talk with their doctor about. And hopefully that way we're going to get some further research and treatment options and support, you know, because this patient population has been um, very neglected. So, um, and then what was the rest of the question? I feel like I answered part of it. Um, I just said, do people recover? Oh, you know? yes. There are people, sorry, I got off on a, a tangent. And yes, you will um, definitely recover because, I mean, I can just share from my own personal experience. Um, so I still do have some lingering fine symptoms. And, um, but I've learned, first of all, they're much less in intensity. So I'm four years off of the benzodiazepine um, at this point, And I still feel like I'm getting some, um, even recovering even four years out or four years off the drug. And, um, and, you know, I'm leaps and bounds better than in my taper day. So I've definitely experienced some healing and, and also I've learned to kind of cope with some of these lingering symptoms and accept them and found some new skills and some workarounds and things like that. So you know, I'm back to full and functional life as I describe it. And so I would just say that, you know, if you're going through this process, it can be, you know, a, a slow process because you've had damage to the nervous system and, but there is neuroplasticity and the brain does heal. So, so just don't give up on that. Yeah. I mean, even people I know who took a really long time, like me and people before me, you know, said that even when they were back to life, like where you are, Christy, and functioning, that they thought that they were like close to healed. But then as the year sort of, you know, added up, they realized like, oh, I still had some to do. And I was still like healing in the, you know, the couple more years after that. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I find it amazing because I think that this would be the best I could be. But then I still have little things happen here. And they're like, oh, okay, this is better. And so it just, it takes a long time. Yeah. So you and I know just from working in this space so much and like dedicating so much of ourselves to benzodiazepine issues that like language is a big, huge thing. I mean, people, you know, wrongly calling this addiction and not understanding that there's physical dependence or even when I see people like, with all the best intentions, like writing things to help our community, but they call us like benzodiazepine users, you know, words like that can conjure up things in doctor's minds or people who are reading the paper, just the word user, when you could just simply reframe it and say like people who were prescribed benzodiazepines or, you know, just right, right. that sort of thing. So paying like extra close attention to language and so I'm sure that's the same case as like when you're naming a condition, which the whole, the whole process even has like a term it's called nosology, right? When you're, mm -hmm. when you're naming something. So I guess when people are, you know, naming other conditions where they want, it's like a new thing and they want medical recognition or whatever, you have to put a ton of thought into it, but, but what exactly is the naming process and like in general, even if it's not benzos, you know, for bind for anything, what kind of thing do you have to go through in order to get something in like accepted by medicine as a real legitimate condition, if that makes sense? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I'm not sure I can give you a full answer. I did, I looked up the term nosology so we can have the, the exact definition, but it's basically the branch of science that deals with classification of diseases. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, the process we went through was using that Delphi method to, uh, because it was something structured and accepted in the literature. Um, and so we could kind of come to a, a consensus on the name. And we were looking for something that was, you know, descriptive of, of what was actually occurring and that um, could, I think the, the bonus was the, the nice little acronym, the BINDS that we can easily say and share with physicians. Physicians always love a catchy acronym. So yeah, so, yeah but, but I'm, you know, other illnesses, you know, being named, I, I'm not sure I can comment. On that yeah, I'm just wondering like if there's anything else to do and maybe you don't know that's like further you know to get it sort of like picked up and accepted by medicine as something real and legitimate yeah I know? do think getting it into the medical literature is the first step because if it's not if it's not in the medical literature it basically just doesn't exist so yeah. I mean once we just get the term out there and use it more and more then it's going to be more widely accepted. Yeah. And you guys had a, a benzodiazepine nosology group. I think, did you already explain this? Who was part of the group besides it was you and Bernie from who's the founder of the Alliance for Benzo Best Practices mm -hmm. and who else was in the group? Yeah. So there were 23 of us, I believe. And I'm not sure I can recall all the names, but a lot of them were people that were on the Alliance's um, medical board, advisory board, and there were some um, benzodiazepine survivors as well. So it was, we really just wanted to make sure there were a combination of medical experts and then people with lived experience as well. And then of course there was people like myself that um, had both, so. Mm -hmm. And just curious um, from somebody who wasn't involved, how long did it take you guys to like land on Bind? Was it a long, you know? Back yeah, I think the whole process, I'd have to look back in my email, but probably went over the period of like three months or so once we got started. Okay. All right. So I'm wondering if I know the third paper just got released publicly on Thursday. So two days ago, so it's brand new and it's getting picked up by the media. I think it's been in psychology today already. I saw um, has anybody given any feedback on this third paper or just the naming of bind in general? Um, like I yeah, said, I know I've seen question. like the communities using it some, and I've even seen people calling it a bind, like they're adding a for antidepressants, but yeah. Yeah. That's, that's kind of interesting. Um, so on the paper itself, not a lot of feedback just because it literally came out into the world on Thursday afternoon. Yeah. Um, but I will say that the term has been in use in the community for, I think about a year now, um, cause Dee Foster and I, um, maybe even a little longer cause we recorded a, um, talk on bind for, um, the Colorado consortium's Benzo action work group. And then it's, it's pretty much been adopted by the benzodiazepine community since then. And, in general, the feedback from the community itself has been positive because I think people feel like it, um, um, you know, describes accurately what they're going through. I mean, I've heard some other criticism that maybe, um, you know, you're just adding a new name and this is just going to create con more confusion. So, I mean, we'll just kind of have to see how the whole thing plays out, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I understand the criticism is like, all right, whenever you're trying to make something new, I mean, obviously it's just sort of like the Ashton manual. I don't think it's perfect, but it was a great start. You know, it was a good place for us to perfect and move forward from. And, you know, um, even if bind doesn't take off or doesn't wind up being the end all be all in, in my opinion, I guess like the more stuff that's out in the literature uh, like even the fact that people are just attempting to name this thing and say like look this is happening or whatever it's just more sort of evidence that it's real whatever the hell we wind up 
calling it in the end, you know? So, right. Yeah, for sure. And I think the more we build that body of literature, that's probably one of the most important things that we can do is just getting it out there so that the medical profession believes us. And yeah, I mean, I, the, you know, we, we like the term, but I guess we're not married to it. We'd like it to be in use going forward. But again, you know, the most important thing is, um, the patients and that we're, um, getting their needs served. Yeah. So I just want to say if anybody's watching, um, you know, this is Facebook live. So if you have used the term bind and you're here with us and, you know, let's say you've used it with your doctor or something like that, I'm wondering what the feedback is. And if you're watching on YouTube later, please leave a comment and let us know if bind was effective as a way um, for you to present this to your your medical providers. And now we'll have the third paper that people can print and take in and, and uh, we'll see how it's received by people who don't know anything about this. You know, when you go in and say, I have this, (laughs) you know, read this paper. So let us know what happens when you do that. If you do. Um, All right. Last question here. And then if anybody in the audience has any questions for Christy, I'll pose them to her. Um, what else do you guys have planned? Are you are you still getting papers? Are we going to have paper number four from the survey? And um, if so, what what's it going to be about? And then what other research do we need in regards to BIND itself? Yeah, so very good question. So I think this is going to be our third and final survey paper. We're going to, we're not ruling out ever reporting more data from the the survey because there there was a lot of data. There's still more there to report, but we're just you know moving on to do other things that we might think be more effective. So we're currently um, looking at doing a review of the current literature and getting something published about that, and you know tying um, bind into what we can find from the current literature, which is, again is probably not much. Um, but we also are wanting to do. A, a larger study in the general population, you know, seeing if we can correlate um, benzodiazepines with these symptoms and life effects of bind. And I mean, I think that's going to be more important when we can identify it in the the general population, mm-hmm. basically. And then, and then I think our what we've done so far is going to be a good jumping off point for raising more awareness and educating doctors and you know preventing people from getting harmed um, from the get-go and then, you know, finding support and treatment options for people that are already affected. Yeah. Yeah. Recognizing it in the general population is a huge one because if we can get people er early, you know, and be able to know what this is, I think it was Ashton. I found a quote buried within all of the things that she left us with saying something like, uh, I think there's a huge population of people walking around out there being damaged by these drugs who have no idea that it's happening essentially and in my case that I mean you recognized yours I think fairly quickly being able to you know figure it out because it happened so soon in your process but mine was very insidious and I because I would, I didn't know what I was looking for, you know, for five years, I just sort of lived with this miserable stuff going on and never knew that I was being damaged the whole time, you know? So I just wonder all the time, like how many people are out there just walking around with this ticking time bomb and all these horrible, miserable symptoms. And they just think it's them or their mental illness, or they're so tired, or they just don't feel good, you know? Yeah. Oh, I, I wonder the same. Yeah. Um, Oh, one more question before we close. Are you guys presenting BIND or your papers or have you at any like medical conferences and to other medical providers? And I'm just wondering if so, like, have you had any feedback from them when you gave presentations? Yeah. So I actually did a poster before our paper was even um, out into the world. So this was back in April. I went to the American Society of Addiction Medicine annual meeting. Mm -hmm. And so I just stood by my little poster and I talked about, I I talked to whoever came by and people seem mostly receptive to it. There was definitely some, some interest. And so, you know, I'm looking forward to, um, 
getting more information about that. Like I'm going to go to a conference of medical providers in a couple of weeks, flying to Boulder, Colorado. So, I mean, there's going to definitely going to be more opportunities um, come up as this grows. Okay, cool. And I know we have some CME over at the Colorado Consortium. Is there bind CME? Is that one? Yeah, there actually is. So it, that one's not out yet. So we did a four part lecture series. And I think one of them covered benzo prescribing, one covered deep prescribing, one covered adverse effects. And then the last one was um, bind. That was the one presented by me and Dee Foster. And we actually recorded that last summer. And it's, it's finally going to make its world way into the world any minute now. And there was, um, so there's two of them are actually already out the prescribing and the deep prescribing talk done by Alexis Ritvo and Jeff Gold and, um, and ours should be out shortly. So yeah, that's going to be great to have formal CME on the topic of bind. Yeah. Okay. For anybody who doesn't know what that is, it's medical education. So, you know, doctors and PAs and nurse practitioners in order to keep licensed, they have to keep learning and they have to get credits for, for learning. So there's going to be a course essentially. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, we'll link in the description, the available CME for benzodiazepines that exists already. And then Christy, I guess you can let us know when the, the bind CME is available for people. Yeah, definitely will. Okay. Well, it looks like we don't have any questions. So we're about time, I guess, before we go, do you have any closing thoughts that you want to leave us with? Um, I guess mainly it's just been a, you know, a pleasure working on this project. We've had a great um, survey team. I'm working with the Foster, Alexis Ritvo, Peter Martin, Reed Finlayson, and um, Bernie Silvernail. And, you know, I've learned so much from this experience and um, it's just really nice to get um, this information out into the world and um, hopefully it can start to change medical practice going forward and you know I would encourage all of you if you know show the paper to your doctor and you know talk to them about the new terminology and um, let me know how it goes yeah that was one other thing. How can people in the withdrawal community, because I always say like there's power in numbers. We have so many of us, unfortunately, who were affected in this way. Um, and we're all sort of gathered in one place, which is great. So we have access to each other. How can they, you know, spread the word about the paper and that kind of thing just to everybody? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's good if you can share it on your social media because everybody has, um, you know, their personal contacts and even share it with your um, medical providers if you feel so inclined. I mean, I, um, I think just we can, if you can just start with your own personal base of contacts that um, that's something. Yeah. Agree. Okay. All right, Christy. Well, thank you so much for coming and talking about this. And thanks to you and everybody else who put so much energy and effort into the survey and the papers and just working so hard to bring, you know, awareness and education around benzodiazepine issues. So we're really grateful to you for that. Um, thanks everybody out there who's listening and who joined us today for this discussion. If you haven't seen the film Medicating Normal yet and you want to, you can go to our website at medicatingnormal.com slash watch. We have more interviews coming up. If you check our Facebook tab under events, you can see all of the scheduled ones to come. And thanks again, Dr. Christy Huff. Thanks everybody else for tuning in and we'll see you soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.